Well, good evening and thank you for taking the time to join for another time of looking into God's Word as we study this beautiful book of Hebrews. Our subject this evening will be taken from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. So if you want to get your Bibles and be prepared after our music video, we'll go right into the study. Solid Reasons for Hope, Hebrews 6, 13 to 20, is where we're going to be going briefly. So um, just get your Bible so you can follow along. Here now, our worship team singing a song that uh, is quite relevant. It's talking about Jesus, our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the dark Yes. 
Jesus Christ, our living hope. Praise God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise today. We thank you for the opportunity that we have of being able to bow in your presence and know that we're, we're, we're speaking with and communing with our living Savior. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for all your goodness and your mercy to us. We pray for your Holy Spirit to, to guide, to illuminate, and to help us to just mine the, the, the treasures, the riches from your word as we get into your word now. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Father. Amen. Well, we praise the Lord for his presence and the opportunity of being able to share uh, his word with you again. We're going to open that word right now and read the portion of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is God's holy word. We're looking at the solid reasons for hope that the author has presented here in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. Now, in the Bible, hope in the Bible is, is presented as an existing reality, something not yet finally or fully possessed by the one exercising that hope. Hope is aligned with the principle of faith in that, in that it represents what faith is being exercised for. So one is exercising uh, his faith in order to have full possession here and now of something that has been purchased and is, in a sense, in our hope chest. This is what is being referenced when we read the following um, verse in the book of Hebrews, not under our study right now, but in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse uh, 1, it reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. That's what the King James Version reads. Uh, the ESV says, Now faith is the assurance of things to hope for, uh, the conviction of things not seen. Now you would notice uh, that neither the King James Version, the ES Version, says that it's things not existing. Rather, things not seen. In other words, the finished and accomplished works of God on our behalf are all the objects of our hope. They exist already because Jesus declared them to be finished or completed. To, to use the, the, the more graphic imagery of Jesus' declaration on the cross as he gave up his spirit, we could use the, the phrase, it is consummated. That's not what we usually read when we read uh, the text there in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 30, as Jesus was anticipating being with his Father next. 
knowing that he had come and had completed the task, he declared, it is consummated. Normally it's rendered, it is finished. But, but that is the idea, the purpose for which Jesus humbled himself to become a man, for which he had given up his divine prerogatives, becoming lower than the angels, as the writer of Hebrews tells us and reminds us, the purpose for which he voluntarily laid down his life was now consummated. The prophecies were fulfilled. Salvation has been purchased. And so, at that point in time, Jesus made a declaration. The, dec the declaration was that the dispensation of grace was initiated, and it was set in motion now. We are in a dispensation of God's favor, of God's grace through Jesus Christ. And I think there's a beautiful illustration of this idea of hope. We find in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 27. Now, when you read that portion of Scripture, if it, or you might remember, this is getting towards the very end of the book of Acts. Uh, here, uh, in Acts chapter 27, verse, verses 14 through the end of the chapter, chronicles that, that great storm in which Luke and Paul were on a vessel heading for Rome. Now, we know that Paul was in more than one storm. He talks about it himself. But this is one of those in which Luke, the, the chronicler um, of Acts, is there as well. And so Luke describes the severity of the storm by making this statement in verse 20 of that chapter of Acts. He says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us. Listen, here's what he says. All hope of our being saved was at last Then Luke goes on to describe the next thing that happens. He described how Paul turned the mental tide of some of the crew and the centurion who was in charge of all the prisoners. Paul assured them that an angel of God had spoken to them, spoken to him rather, and had declared that not only was Paul going to stand before Caesar, but also that none of those on the vessel would lose their lives. Now, the power of Paul's words are seen at the very end of that chapter, when the centurion refused to allow his soldiers to kill the prisoners so as to prevent their escape. You see, the centurion had assurance that what Paul had said, what God had told him, was as good as done. No life would be lost. So even when the physical anchors could not hold the ship, hope became an anchor that the centurion had hooked on to Paul's words. Hope, this passage tells us, is the anchor of the soul, even in events of life, and even for persons who do not know Christ. Hope is a principle. But here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 13 to 20, we were given a clear and really essential criteria by which we can determine the reliability of our hope. Each of these, or all of these criteria, are linked to God, linked to his person, linked to his character, and linked to his accomplishments. So to assist us in maintaining confidence in our salvation, of, of, of living with an outlook saturated by hope, with hope. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of the certainty of God's promises and the reasons behind that certainty. He points to God's sworn promise to Abraham. Verses 13 to 14 read, When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by home to swear, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. He says that God swore by himself. The God who is infallible, all-powerful, the same God who spoke the universe into existence, sustains it by his word. This God who is without 
variance in his character. This God made an oath to do something. And if I may sort of humanize the picture, God, after looking around in heaven and finding no one or nothing more worthy by which to swear, he swore by himself that he would bless and multiply Abraham. And so the writer of Hebrews builds this, this dramatic argument. He crescendos up to verse 18. And then he says, So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have, what? Strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. By two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. The two unchangeable things. Reference here are the person of God and the promise of God. Or if you please, the nature of God and the character of God. And by, by nature, there is no one or any, anything else greater than God. He swore by himself. In terms of his character, he's not only holy, so that whatever he declares is true and reliable, but also, related to his character, his intentions are unquestionable. In other words, his promise is reliable because he is holy, loving. And his promise is reliable because he is omnipotent by nature and character. So whatever God does and whatever God says, they're all always consistent with who he is in nature and who he is in character. These are the traits and the characteristics of God that the writer assures us uh, that, that, that we can have confidence in holding fast to the hope set before us. Not only did Abraham discover that God could do what he said he would do, Yes, he discovered that God could do it and that he did what he said he would do because of those realities. We ourselves, who have fled to refuge, we might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We, you and me, have every reason to hold fast to the hope we have in Christ. The full realization of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, the complete fruit of that consummation is already a reality. Only in our spiritual bodies will it be fully manifested to us and in us. So we, we wait for the rapture, we wait for death and resurrection to take place. And then it all, the full completed package of what Jesus did for us on the cross becomes ours in eternity. So again, the, the writer reminds us in verse 19 that we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. What is this? Or what is this this that he's referring to? We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It is, it's the same, isn't it? Is it, it's not, is it not the same, as you could, you could ask the question? Uh, as what he said was the guarantee that Abraham could hold on to, the nature, the character of God, holding on to the person of God and the promise of God. You see, as Christians, we, we must recognize that what is said of God is also true of Jesus. That's why the writer highlights verse 20 and focuses on Jesus there. Not only is the God of the Old Testament the same God of the New Testament? Jesus, the Messiah, embodies divinity in all respects. He is God in nature and God in character. His person and his promise guarantee a salvation. Now we have to remember here that, that the high priestly role of Jesus is the general focus of this section by the writer of Hebrews. And we recall that not only is Jesus described as the ever-living 
high priest who continues to intercede for us. But we want to note again that the sacrifice offered by Jesus in his high priestly ministry is that of himself, his blood, for the expiation of our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins, and as John says, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is described in the imagery of this final verse as, as being behind the curtain. Now, of course, this is not a description of where Christ is currently, for, for we have been told that he is seated at the right hand of God. So this picture, this image, is connecting the actions of the high priest and that of Jesus with reference to atonement. You recall from reading scripture that only once a year that the high priest enter behind that curtain, the purpose of which was to offer the blood of atonement for the sins of the nation. And so when Jesus died on the cross, symbolically, he entered behind that curtain, the curtain that separated the presence of the Holy God from sinful humanity, to offer his shed blood, to cover and atone for our sins. What happened on earth and time had already happened in eternity past. What happened on earth in history, on a spiritual level, happened in heaven in eternity itself. Yes, because what Jesus did then is still good today. Our hope of salvation is therefore not wishful thinking. That's not what we mean by hope. Neither is it a faint possibility based on our good intentions or our good behavior. Again, neither is our hope of salvation some universal reality which all can optimistically hope to enjoy. We may present it that way sometimes. Unfortunately, but our hope of salvation depends on the finished, consummated work of Jesus on the cross. Yes. But it, it also is dependent on our faith and our dependence upon Christ's sacrificial, salvific death on the cross. So we are encouraged in this passage to place our faith and to keep our faith attached to the person of Jesus, our great high priest. Verse 12 reminds us of this emphasis on faith. It reads, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. We're encouraged to exercise faith and patience with confidence, because these are grounded on two unchangeable things, our faith and our patience, and confidently withstand the ravages of time, the tests of everything else that goes on during that time, because these are grounded on two unchangeable things, the unchangeable nature the unchangeable character of God. The unchangeable nature, the unchangeable character of God. Later on, the writer of Hebrews speaks about faith and that when we come to God, we must believe that, number one, he exists. And secondly, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That first reference, the existence of God gives us direct reference to God's nature. He is the self-existing one, the one who is the I am. As he revealed himself to Moses, that Jesus himself made reference to himself as the I am. The nature of God, the unchangeable nature. And secondly, the unchangeable character. Not only believe that God exists, but believe that he's a rewarder. God's intention toward us is that love and goodness. Of course, 
We see it on the cross most vividly. Thank God we have solid reasons for hope through Christ. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bow before you in prayer. There are many needs that we have, the many concerns that your people have here and around the world. But we want to just give you thanks that whatever those needs and those concerns may be, we have confidence that you are in charge. We have a confidence that not only are you able, but you are willing. And so, Lord, hear the cries of your people. Hear your people, wherever they are, calling out to you for salvation, for healing, for deliverance, for the supply of the needs that they have, Lord, this time. For those who are crying out to you and praying for the salvation of their children, for their spouses, we join with them this evening. O oh Lord, hear the prayers of the hurting, grieving parents who see their children that they raised maybe in church and Sunday school, drifting away from you. O oh God, they're calling out to you in prayer. O oh Father, send the hound of heaven after those children to bring them into the fold. And for those maybe wives who have, been, who have been praying, who have been praying for their unsaved husbands for years. O oh Lord, hear their prayers. We know that your word tells us that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Because of that, Lord, they're not able to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we pray that you remove these blinders from their minds. Open up their hearts and their minds to receive the good news of Jesus, of his death and his resurrection, his love for them, of these unsaved spouses who have come to know of Jesus, have hope. We pray these things, Lord, as we continue to lift up our country and lift up the world during this time, that, thank you, Lord, you are in charge. Amen. Again, thank you for taking the time to be um, saturated by the Word of God. It takes time. If we want the Word of God to have any impact on us, we have to allow the Word of God to come in to our hearts and our minds. We have to take time to do that. So thank you for joining us for this Bible study each week. Invite some of your friends. Invite some of your families that to, to set aside this time. Whenever you're going to be watching this video on YouTube or Facebook, say, come and join us. It's not that long, usually around 30 minutes, sometimes less than that. But the entire time we spend, it's certainly worth it. So until next week, may God richly bless you and prosper you in the things that he has set as part of your purpose in this world. Amen. Our Sunday CBH Viewpoint on Radio Cayman at 8.30 a.m. And then 9.30 a.m. we have our Sunday school and 10.30 the worship service. And of course, we have times for prayer during the week. Sunday, 7 and to 8 p.m. we have Zoom prayer time. We would love more of you to join us for that. And then Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m., prayer in the sanctuary. Again, inviting you to join us for those times. Until next week, may God strengthen you, sustain you, and allow you to be a witness to His grace. <laughs>